Well, thank you. You know, we were singing about, I am a child of God, and that just really struck me. What an honor to say that we are a child of God. Man, that is awesome. You know, prior to Jesus, uh, people couldn't talk that way. Man, Jesus changed everything, and sometimes we take it for granted. You know, someday we're going to know all things, even as also we are known, is what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And so when we get to heaven, we aren't going to have to have meetings like this and conferences and preach. But you know what? We are going to continue to sing. The ministry of music is going to continue throughout eternity once my ministry is well long over. So man, praise and worship is pretty awesome. You need to take advantage of that. Also, let me just comment that that lady that you saw, I don't know if she's here this morning, but I talked to her yesterday. The one who was talking about that our staff is so sweet and so kind and so loving. Uh, she was just amazed at that. And I got to telling her, I said, well, it's just Jesus living through him. And she was like, how do you do that? <laughs> and I got to telling her, I said, you have the same Jesus living on the inside of you that you see in these other people. And she, for whatever reason, she just hadn't connected those dots. She felt the way that she had always been, the way that she grew up was who she was. And I got to saying, you're this brand new person on the inside. And you can be loving and kind. And man, I can see her just changing in front of my eyes. It was awesome. And I tell you, everybody needs to get that revelation. You are a different person on the inside. And the way that you were raised and your hangups and all of this stuff, that's not the real you. The real you is a perfect person if you've been born again. You are identical to Jesus in your spirit. And the rest of the Christian life is just renewing your mind and getting to where you act like who the Bible says you are. Sometimes people feel like, well, I'd be a hypocrite to act that way. Well, it depends on who you consider is a real you. If you think this old snarky, mean, critical person is the real you, well then yeah, you'd be a hypocrite to act differently. But if you see yourself in Christ and recognize you're a new creature, you're a hypocrite to act the way that you were programmed before you got born again. Isn't that awesome? Praise God. Let's turn back over to the book of Ephesians. I was in Ephesians starting on Thursday night and I was ministering about how to stand strong in evil times. So let me go back to Ephesians chapter 6. In verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I made a major point that the devil doesn't have any power. All he can do is deceive you. So that's the reason that if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. Because the only power of deception is if you're ignorant of what's happening. He only has lies and deceptions. And so you have to stand strong against the wiles of the devil. In verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, you know, that song that Raquel was singing, I think it was Raquel or maybe Emily, but singing about that he's higher than all principalities and powers. That's exactly what this verse is saying. In verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And in case you haven't noticed, we are living in an evil day. The truth is we're always living in an evil day. There has never been a time that uh, Satan isn't out seeking whom he may devour. Sometimes it's more obvious than others. And really, during times of persecution, the church flourishes because they recognize we're under attack. They recognize that Satan is trying to destroy us, and so they seek the Lord, and they set aside things that distract them. Prosperity has hindered the body of Christ much, much more than affliction ever had. If you go back through church history, every time the church is afflicted, persecuted, they prosper and people grow. Like right now, the largest, the fastest growing part of the body of Christ is in Iran. There are people being converted by the 
thousands, hundreds of thousands. We got Diana Hyde someplace. Where's Diana? She's over here. Stand up, Diana. This lady is one excited lady right here. And uh, anyway, she's got quite the testimony, but she, she was raised and, and actually arrested because she sang. Women couldn't sing under the Muslim thing, and she was given a death sentence. It was commuted to just 99 lashes. They beat her with 99 lashes, but man, she found the Lord, and she is excited about what God's doing, and the Lord has appeared to her. And there are people that by the millions, by the millions are seeing Jesus. I mean, we, Mohammed Faridi, who, man, he's a, he's a great guy. If you haven't seen him, we've got some videos about him on our website. And I remember the very first day that he came to Karis Bible College, I just happened to be standing by the front door and he walked in with a backpack and he was Iranian. And I looked at him and I said, who are you? And he said, my name is Mohammed. And I said, are you friendly? <laughs> He reminds me of that. And he said, yeah, he was friendly. But uh, anyway, he graduated from our Bible college. He's now the head of Iranian Christians International. And he is going over there. And I mean, it is miraculous. It is miraculous. He said that Iran was very, very close to imploding that the people are so fed up with this. The people of Iran are not for the government that's running it. They hate it. They're being oppressed. And they were protesting in the streets and they were expecting America to come to their aid and support them. They said that uh, with the sanctions that were against them, Iran was very close to just literally losing everything. And Biden stepped in and freed up $18 billion worth of frozen assets and began to start, uh, you know, broke the treaty and stuff and allowed them to start pr uh, processing nuclear stuff again. And he said it just kind of squelched the whole thing. Uh, man, he said it. But there, there is so much that, uh, people that are against it. I forgot exactly why I got off on that. <laughs> but Muhammad, I was talking about that during persecution, the church prospers. And man, the church is growing by leaps and bounds in Iran. So the point is that, see, when people realize that we're in a battle, when they recognize that this is a threat not only to us individually, but to everybody else around us, and that Satan only comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, when the body is aware of that and they're on guard and fighting, the body of Christ is unstoppable. But the thing that destroys us is when we get complacent. And, you know, I heard somebody just recently, they did a survey and they said, so what is the purpose of Christianity? And Christians begin to answer, so that I could be happy. So that I could have joy. So that, that is not the purpose of Christianity. And this is one of the reasons that we have so many problems is because people think that Christianity is all just about to make my life easy. Praise God as we were singing that we are a child of God and that our sins are forgiven and it's wonderful. But I guarantee you, brothers and sisters, we are in a battle every moment of every day. Satan is trying to destroy us individually. He's trying to destroy the freedoms that we have in America. And when the body of Christ wakens up and recognizes that we are in a battle and starts standing, we're unstoppable when we start drawing on the power of God. But the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things will stop the word of God. It'll choke it. And this is where the body of Christ in America has been. We've enjoyed such prosperity and such freedom that the body of Christ has been sitting around the campfire singing Kumbaya as the world burns. And man, it's, it's, I, I think it's really great. I believe we're in a third great awakening. I haven't got time to explain that, but the Lord spoke that to me. You aren't going to hear that listening to the 10 Spies Network, but I tell you what, we are in a great move of God. People's lives are being changed, and I think that all of this negative stuff that's happening is waking up a sleeping giant and that the body of Christ is standing up. So we have to take unto us the full armor of God 
uh, that we may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. John 17, 17, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So God's word is truth. We need to be completely surrounded with God's word. Truth is gonna set us free, make us free. And having on the breastplate of righteousness, that's what I talked about yesterday. And I tell you, I could just go back and talk about that, about being in right standing with God, not based on what you've done, but based on what Jesus has done. This is what Jim was teaching about the blood covenant. It's all based on the person who made the covenant with God. Jesus shed his blood and we were in him and we are now righteous through Jesus. And if you see that, that's a breastplate that just stops all of Satan's blows against you. Man, that is powerful. We could talk about that for a very, very long time. So you have to have on the breastplate of righteousness and then your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, most people haven't thought about this, but one of the greatest inventions in the history of the world is shoes. Did you know that when they invented shoes and sandals that uh, so many diseases are communicated through, like if you're walking barefoot, you cut your feet, you get an infection and things like this. That's one of the greatest things that extended the life of people in the history of the world is shoes. And in warfare, the Romans, they had sandals that had sim something similar to what we call cleats today and it allowed them to have traction and that they could uh, march. And, and this was one of the things that gave the Roman army such an advantage was their footwear. And did you know that what you wear on your feet is important? If you were barefoot, I guarantee you, you wouldn't be able to run very far without stepping on something. You'd hurt yourself. Shoes are important. They are really important. And this says that you are supposed to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And did you know this isn't talking about peace among men. This isn't talking about peace between you and somebody else. This is talking about the gospel that God's warfare against your sin was placed on Jesus and God placed all of his wrath upon Jesus. Man, I don't want to stay here the whole time. I certainly could, but... Most people don't understand this. In John chapter uh, 12, in verse uh, 30, could you put that up on the screen here? In John chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus answered and said, this is after he had heard an audible voice that said, this is my beloved son, hear him. And they heard this voice and some people said it was thunder. <laughs> they heard an audible voice from God and yet some people just refused to believe that this was an audible voice. Did you know if you don't have a heart to receive from God, it wouldn't matter if Jesus walked in here in his physical body, you'd find some way to explain it away. You have to have a heart to receive. These people were saying it was thunder, but he, said, he answered and he said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Did you know in the King James Bible, the word men is italicized. What that means is it wasn't in the original language. They added it trying to bring clarification. I'm not against that. Did you know there's not a word for word translation from one language to another? I've ministered in many different languages and man, you see this all of the time. Uh, different people will interpret you differently and stuff. It's not always a word for word thing. And so the King James translators were honest enough that when there wasn't a word there, they would let you know that they added this. This is one of the reasons I like the King James Bible is because it has, I believe, much more integrity than other translations. I use other translations. I'm not against them. I'm not a King James only guy, but I believe it's the best. And you can disagree with that and you're entitled to your opinion, but I'm not going to agree with you or we'd both be wrong. <laughs> so anyway, the King James says that he shall draw all unto him. The word men is italicized, meaning that they just stuck that in. It wasn't there, but they were trying to say all what? 
And so they said, well, he'll draw all uh, men unto him. And from this, people think that if we just preach Jesus properly, and if we really presented him the way that he should, he would just draw huge crowds, that our churches would be big. We'd all have mega churches. Did you know you can look around and the mega churches, not all of them, but the majority of them have compromised to get where they are. Big churches aren't necessarily lifting Jesus up properly. You know, uh, Bill Hybels, I think is his name in Chicago. He's the one that started the seeker-friendly thing and they changed things and made it to where it's like a 10, 15-minute message and it was all show, uh, smoke and mirrors. And he did this uh, intentionally saying that he was trying to draw in people that were unbelievers, people that weren't religious. And then once he got them, he would get them involved in small groups and things like this. And anyway, he grew his church, I don't even know, tens of thousands of people. But after a decade or two of doing this, Bill Hybels himself came out and said, it's a failure. We drew crowds, but we have not made them Christians. They are not disciples. And the guy who was really one of the leaders in doing this has admitted it's a failure. Just drawing large numbers of people doesn't mean that this, these people are turned on and committed to God. Matter of fact, I was at a church, I was a part of a church that had over 10,000 members in it and the pastor, he was talking to me and I said, he asked something about letting me come preach and I said, I'm not sure you want me to preach. I said, if you were to turn this church over to me in a month's time, I could whittle, it was over 10,000. I said, I could whittle it down to 5,000, I guarantee you at least. And I said, if you were to give it to me for 30, uh, you know, for uh, three months or something like that, it'd probably whittle down to one or 2,000. There's a lot of people today that are flirting with Christianity and don't possess it. So anyway, my point is that this isn't saying that Jesus will just draw all people unto him. You know, one of the greatest revelations I ever had in my life was in 1976. And I had just left a, a church in Seagaville, Texas. I had gone to Childress, Texas and ministered. And I rented this uh, place called the Women's Department uh, Store. And I rented it and put an ad in the paper. And the first night we had six people show up. And then it got up over three nights to where we had 30 people. And I just thought, well, this isn't it. And so I was getting ready to leave. And in my sleep, the Lord spoke to me and gave me a dream. I won't go into the whole thing, but told me that I didn't do what he told me to do. So I got up at like three o'clock and I said, but I came here and I held a meeting and if you wanted more people to come, why didn't you draw them? And I used this verse about if you be lifted up, you'll draw all men unto you. And he said, if the people were spiritual enough to hear me say, go hear Andrew Womack tonight at 7.30 at the Women's Department Club, then they, I wouldn't need you to preach to them. He says they aren't spiritual, they're carnal. You got to come across their path in some physical way. And then once you get their attention, you start ministering to their spirit man. And did you know that that changed my whole perspective? And I decided, well, how do I reach people? And he said, go on radio. And I went out that day to a radio station. It was a country and Western radio station. And I mean, it was in this little podunk town, Childress, Texas. And I had to shoo the chickens off the porch and step over the uh, wood, you know, that had fall, rotted through and step over that so I wouldn't fall through the porch. And I went in and it turned out that the guy who ran the station was Burl Bumpus. He was a Baptist pastor. And I said, could I put a Christian program on this station? And he said, yes. And so I put me and Kenneth Copeland on. And that's how I got started in media ministry in 1976 and was on radio. And stuff, and so I, I realized that this isn't saying that God will just draw all men unto him. That's not true. And if you take it in context, that 30th verse says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And then he says, And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all unto me. And then the next verse says, This spake he signifying what death he should die. Not talking about that he's going to draw all men unto him, but he was saying that when I am lifted up on the cross, that I will draw all, all what? I believe it was all judgment. All of God's judgment 
all of God's judgment, not some of it, but all of God's judgment against sin. Not only my sin, but your sin, the sin of the whole world, the sin of people who haven't even been born again, people who haven't even accepted the Lord, all of God's wrath on sin for all times past, present, and even future, all of God's judgment on sin was placed on Jesus. He was like a lightning rod that drew every bit of God's judgment unto himself. And God judged sin. You know, one of the things you'll hear today is people say, man, sin's got to be judged. God is a holy God. God can't look the other way. And they will say that America, the things that we're doing with all of this woke culture and the things we're doing, God's going to judge. If God doesn't judge America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah because America has become that ungodly. Well, I agree that America is ungodly, but if God does judge America, he'll have to apologize to Jesus because all of God's judgment came upon Jesus. Does this mean that America is safe? No, because we're in the process of letting Satan destroy us. To whom we yield ourselves, servants to, his, we, servants to him we are, to whom we obey. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. And America has kicked God out of our schools, said we don't want you, we don't want these things, and we have embraced the devil, and Satan only comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And if you do that, he's going to eat your lunch and... There you go. <laughs> That's funny. And uh, so Satan is in the process of trying to destroy this nation. We're losing liberties and things like that. I'm not saying that America is safe, but I'm saying God's not the one that's judging us. It's us reaping what we sow. As we lower our standards and we start allowing homosexuality and transgenderism and all kinds of perversion and things like this, we're in the process of destroying ourselves. So we need a great move of God, and I believe that we are beginning to experience some of the beginnings of that. So all of God's wrath came upon Jesus. He is not mad at you. He's not even in a bad mood. If you've been born again, you are now the righteousness of God in your spirit. God is the spirit. He looks at you in the spirit realm and he sees you righteous and holy and pure. Man, that is awesome. And this is what we've got to have our feet shod with. This is what allows us to do things that we couldn't do without this preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, look over here in uh, Luke chapter 2. We just finished the Christmas season. And we heard these verses, I'm sure, a number of times during this season. It says in verse 8, Luke 2, 8, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. During the Christmas season, we hear this all of the time, and you'll see these movies and stuff, and there'll be strife, and people will say, it's Christmas. You know, let's be kind to each other. And this has become kind of just something that people ascribe that at Christmas time, you're supposed to love, and you're supposed to be kind to people, even if you aren't the rest of the year. <laughs> because there's peace on earth among men. I don't know how many of you are aware of the song that Wadsworth wrote back in the 1800s about I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and loud and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill towards men. But then he goes on and he says, but there is no peace. Hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill towards men. You know, part of what he was saying, he had a son that was wounded. I think he was wounded. I 
think he died, I'm not sure, but he was wounded in the Civil War and he was mourning over the terrible things that were tearing this nation apart. And so he says, this isn't true. Peace on earth, goodwill towards man. And finally, he ends the song by saying, uh, but uh, the bells repeat, or louder still, the be- anyway, I can't quote it. But he talked about that the bells just kept ringing louder and louder and finally he realized that the wrong will fail and the right prevail of peace on earth, goodwill towards man. And he said, someday it'll happen. That's the way he dealt with it. This isn't talking about peace among men. Look at this passage of scripture over here in Matthew chapter 12. And in verse 34, this is Jesus uh, speaking. No, that's not right. How about Matthew chapter 10, verse 34? This is Jesus speaking, and he says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own house. Jesus himself said, I didn't come to send peace on earth. This is a misunderstanding. And see, again, this has been wrongfully interpreted and applied. And because of this, there's a lot of Christians that think, well, I, I'm against these things that are happening. I'm against, uh, you know, sexually abusing our children and giving them hormone blockers and, and changing their sex. I'm against those things, but we're supposed to operate in peace. And we're supposed to have love and we aren't supposed to upset anybody. You can't find that in Scripture. That is a misunderstanding of Scripture. Jesus himself said, I did not come to send peace. There is going to be division. There is going to be people fighting against each other. If you put this together with Matthew chapter 24, he said that the Father is going to betray the Son and the Son, the Father, and all of these things are going to happen. Jesus did not come to bring peace among men. Now, there is no doubt that there has been uh, strife and and problems reconciled as people's hearts get right with God, but that is a byproduct. That is not the focus. Jesus didn't come to bring peace among men. He came to bring peace from God towards men. And this should be the message of the church. And yet the church in large, again, there's great parts of the church that are doing good, but I'm saying as a whole, religion has been teaching that God's angry and he's going to judge you. Repent or else, turn or burn. And that's been the message of the church. And they'll say, that's the gospel. Did you know the word gospel means good news? And my little definition of it is that I read this in a commentary that they said outside of the Bible, the Greek word and I can't even pronounce it, but it's eugelion, or I don't even know how to pronounce that. How do you say it? There you go, right there. (laughs) That Greek word was only used in literature that we have access to two times outside of the Bible, and yet it's used hundreds of times in the Bible, thousands of times in biblical uh, literature and stuff. And the point that they were making was, it means good news, but it was so rare that anything fit what this word said that it literally is more accurate to describe it as the nearly too good to be true news. There was nothing in the natural realm that was nearly too good to be true. But when you came along and started talking about Jesus, that Jesus took all of our sin upon him and he became sin for us and all of God's wrath fell upon him. All of it. Not only for the things you've done in the past, but even the things you haven't done and even the people who aren't born again. God's wrath for their sin was placed on Jesus. Did you know Jesus suffered for Hitler's sin, for Mussolini's sin, for Stalin's sin? I heard Genghis Khan probably killed over 20 million people Did you know Jesus took the punishment for all of those deaths? Now, it doesn't benefit them unless they mix it with faith. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 says, The word preached unto them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. It says in um, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, For by grace are you saved, that's God's part, through faith. 
So God, by grace, has provided a payment for every person's sins. Hitler, Stalin, everybody, any rapist, murderer, Jesus took that sin into his body and he paid for it. But it's not going to benefit them unless they mix it with faith. You're saved by grace, God's part, through faith, that's your part. It says in Romans, or, yeah, Romans chapter 5, verse 2, that we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world, but that does not mean that the whole world is saved because not everybody has put faith in what Jesus has done. But we should be preaching that your sins are forgiven. Your sins are paid for. That there is now peace between God and you. God's not mad at you. He's not even in a bad mood. God loves you because of what Jesus did. And he has opened up the door of salvation to everyone. See, that's what we should be preaching. But by and large, the church is preaching the wrath of God. And this is actually the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant drove people to God out of fear of punishment. The New Testament attracts people unto God through telling them about how good God is and what He's done for them and that He bore your sins. And if a person really understood that message, they would come to God out of love and thanksgiving that Almighty God would become a man this is just amazing to me. That's amazing to me that God himself would become a man. You know, the Bible says that the entire universe fits in the palm, in the span of his hand. And the universe is hundreds of billions of light years across, according to what people can understand. And yet that fits in the palm of his hand. And yet he came and put himself inside of a physical body and was limited to being in one place, at one time and became tired and hungry and he suffered on the cross. I'm not minimizing that any at all, but he suffered for 33 years being in a human body because he loved you, because he loved me. God Almighty limited himself. You know, I think it was Jim talking about if you could imagine an ant. Was that you making that illustration? Huh? Oh, you were talking, who is this? I listened to somebody just recently. You know, I think it was me. <laughs> I, was, I was watching my television program, is what it was. <laughs> That's what it was, it was me. I was, I was watching my television program and I was... I was making this same point and saying, could you imagine a person looking at an ant hill and, and thinking that, man, I'm going to come redeem them. And so you limit yourself to being an ant and living below ground in an ant hill. Man, that doesn't even compare with God Almighty becoming a man. And yet he became a man and he walked past people that just ignored him. Did you know that was part of his suffering? He's the one that created them. He looked at them. He's the one that made them. He knows everything about them, and yet he didn't say anything. He didn't, uh, he didn't just proclaim himself. You know, he could have done things differently. He could have arrived on a 747. Wouldn't that have made an impression back in, you know, when he was born? He could have come on a space shuttle. He could have done all of these things. And yet he lived like just anybody else. The scripture says in Isaiah chapter 53 that when we see him, there is no beauty in him that we should, be, that we should desire him. If I, would have become, if I would have been God and become a man, I'd have been the best specimen of human flesh <laughs> that ever existed. I'd have been bigger and taller. I'd have made Schwarzenegger look pitiful compared to me. Jesus, there was nothing special about him. I don't think he was ugly or anything, but there was nothing special. Nothing special. Can you imagine doing that? And for 33 years, being the one who created everybody, and yet nobody even notices you. Well, you talk about being neglected and not appreciated. There are some people in here that feel like that you aren't honored the way you should be. Man, Jesus bore all of that times a million. 
He did all of these things. He took all of God's judgment upon him. And for you to think that somehow or another you have to still be suffering because you aren't the person you're supposed to be, it's usually out of ignorance that people feel that way. But if you, if you understand, if you're listening to what I'm saying, you choose to think, but I don't care what Jesus paid. I've still got to suffer. There's no way that God could use me and treat me as if I'd never sinned. Well, then you are just, in a sense, thinking that what Jesus did isn't enough. That would be like if you were going to buy something and, you know, it cost you $100. And so you start to give them your credit card or something, and I come up and I say, here, let me pay for it. And I give them my credit card, and it's put on my account. But then you think, but I'm the one that got it. This isn't fair that you're going to pay the whole thing. So I have to pay something. So you go ahead and give them some money anyway. That's just stupid. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> If somebody pays for what you're getting, why in the world would you sit there and feel like you have to pay something too because I'm the one benefiting from it? Well, you're the one that Jesus paid for your sins and yet most of us go around bearing a sin consciousness feeling like, God, there's, how could you ever use me? You feel like somehow or another you have to do penance for your sins. You know, I had a man come to my meeting in Dallas, Fort Worth, and I was teaching along these lines. This has been 20 or 30 years ago, and I was teaching these things. And he literally pulled up his pants leg and showed me his knees, and then he showed me his uh, forearm and elbow. And he had been in the Catholic Church in uh, Mexico. And as penance over Lent, he crawled three miles over broken glass on his hands and knees to do penance. And he told me about some of his friends that were crucified. Some of them actually died through crucifixion as Lent because they were doing penance for their sins. That is a slap in the face of Jesus. That's saying, Jesus, what you did isn't enough. I've also got to suffer for my sin. Most of us wouldn't crawl three and a half miles over broken glass, but many of you will sit there and feel like, well, I know that God heals and I know that God can do miracles, but I'm not sure you'll do it for me because I'm not the person I should be. It's the exact same principle, just a lesser consequence. You may not be crawling over broken glass, but you're sitting here feeling like I'm not worthy. You don't understand the gospel of peace. There is peace between us and God. He paid for your sins. He paid for all of your sins. I don't know that I have time to really do this justice, but I'm going to mention it anyway. Over in Hebrew, man, let me just real quickly try and do this. Hebrews chapter 9 is contrasting the, oh, are you going to teach on this, Jim? You switched it. All right, this is where he was. I don't want to steal your thunder. All right, he switched it already. You should have stayed on this. This is really good. <laughs> Amen. Hebrews chapter 9 is contrasting the way things were done under the old covenant with the way things were done under the new covenant. Did you know under the old covenant, every time a person sinned, they had to offer a sacrifice for that sin because Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says the wages of sin is death. Every time you sin, every time you sin, it produces death. Under the old covenant, through the goodness of God, he allowed us to substitute an animal and shed their blood and cause their death instead of ours. But it was only symbolic. These verses say that the blood of animals and goats could never pay for sin. So because it was only symbolic, every time you sinned, you had to offer a sacrifice. Every new moon, you had to offer a sacrifice. There was a morning sacrifice. There was an evening sacrifice. Every time a woman had a child, she had to offer a sacrifice of purity. Every time you did, man, just a million things, you had to offer these sacrifices. And then once a year you had a day of atonement where the high priest had to go in and offer a sacrifice for all of the sins of the people that they didn't even know about and that they hadn't confessed. At the dedication of the temple, I think Solomon killed over 120,000 sheep and 20,000 oxen. There was just constant shedding of blood. 
under the old covenant, but under the new covenant. Look at this in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. The old covenant offered sacrifices over and over and over and there was a constant sin consciousness, but under the new covenant, Jesus died once, once. You do not have to have the blood reapplied to you. Jesus paid for all of your sins, past, present, and even the sins you hadn't committed yet. Somebody says, how could Jesus pay for a sin before you commit it? Well, you better hope he can because he only died once 2,000 years ago before you ever were born and before you ever committed sin. Jesus paid for the sins of the entire human race, past, present, and future through one sacrifice and he obtained eternal redemption. Those of you that believe that you lose your salvation every time you sin and you're backslidden, if you were to die in that backslidden state, you'd die and go to hell, you are negating what Jesus has done. Jesus died for your sins once, once, and he paid for all of your sins. The next verse says, for now the blood of, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself with, without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance not momentary inheritance until the next time you sin, but eternal inheritance, eternal redemption, eternal inheritance. Five times here in chapter nine, it's contrasting the way it was under the old covenant versus the way it is under the new covenant. Under the old covenant, you were constantly sin conscious and repenting and, oh God, I messed up again. Oh God, forgive me. Under the new covenant, one time sanctified you forever. And there are five times that this is mentioned in chapter nine. I hadn't got time to read them all. If you go down to chapter 10, it talks about that Jesus put in a new covenant into effect through the, his death and resurrection. And in verse 10, it says, by the which will we are sanctified. The word sanctified means to set apart, to make holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You weren't just forgiven up until the time you got born again. You were forgiven once for all. Some people think, well, that's not once for all time. That's once for all people. Keep reading. Look at it in context. The next verse says, And every priest standeth daily, ministering and often, uh, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, not just for all people, but for all time. One sacrifice for all times sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth making his enemies his footstool for by him, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Verse 10 says you were sanctified through the offering of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 14 says if you were sanctified, you have been perfected forever. And people look at this and think, perfect? And they look at their body and they see that they're doing things they shouldn't be doing. They're overweight. They're trying to do that and they can't even overcome being overweight. They can't overcome smoking, drinking doing different things, they search their emotions and they realize that, man, they aren't the way that they're supposed to be. They got bitterness and hurt and pain and stuff like that. And so they, they think, what's wrong with me? They're